Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, Secretary Curley and Commissioner Goldstein will join me to introduce phase two of our economic recovery package. But before I get to that, I want to take some additional time today to talk about racial equity and the movement we're continuing to see across the country. I think it's important to keep a focus on this so we don't lose momentum and make sure this translates into action. I was asked yesterday if this feels different than other times when we've seen calls for change, but little has been done. My answer uh, was yes. I'm not sure what it is, perhaps the magnitude of participation across the nation, but it feels like this time is different. For example, NASCAR has banned Confederate flags from their sanctioned race events. To me, that speaks volumes and it's powerful and I give great credit and, and I'm very proud of uh, Vermont native Steve Phelps, president of NASCAR, for doing so. Because the fact is they risk losing part of their fan base with this move. But they didn't let that stop them. They stepped up to do the right thing. And we need more of that, more people and entities stepping up and doing the right thing, even when it seems hard and even when it seems uncomfortable. And we all need to look at steps we can take, large and small, to increase equity and address systemic racism and disparity. Recently, we launched the Racial Equity Task Force. But I want folks to know that's not all we're going to do in state government. And there's work that's going to be going on for months and, and year, uh, but we need uh, to accelerate it as well. For example, the Department of Public Safety and the Vermont State Police have been focused on fair and impartial policing for years. But they've also joined with law enforcement leaders across the state to issue a 10-point proposal yesterday with actions and reforms to improve policing in Vermont. The point is, we need to make this an ongoing effort. We need to listen and learn, educate each other, and put real action behind it, because this can't just be led by state government. All across Vermont, we need to think about how each of us, individually, can end bigotry and hate, increase equity, and improve the lives of all Vermonters. Now, turning back to our COVID response, three weeks ago, we presented the first phase of a $400 million economic relief package, which proposed directing $310 million of federal CARES Act dollars to small businesses, agriculture, housing, and consumers to help our struggling businesses survive while we work to restart the economy after this pandemic. My team spent weeks on this proposal working with hundreds of employers, associations, community leaders, and legislators to target these dollars to the areas of greatest need. We were inclusive in this work in hopes it would move through the legislature quickly and largely intact. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear uh, that it's going to be the case, as they're only including about a third of the money we recommended. Although I recognize it's just passed the Senate and it hasn't passed through the House fully yet. So while I'm appreciative of the legislature moving forward with something, even if it is a reduced amount, I'm hoping they will get back to work on the remaining $300 million quickly. Because the fact is, while this pandemic has impacted everyone in the state, it has crippled small businesses, the folks who provide the jobs that families rely on and generate the revenue we need for the services we provide in state government. And I can assure you, these employers are on the brink. Some are weeks or even days away from bankruptcy and shutting their doors forever through no fault of their own. They can't wait another month or two for relief. They need our help now. And that's what this CARES money was meant to do to help keep our economies on life support until we get them fully restarted. On our end, we'll continue to answer the legislature's questions and prepare so we can hit the ground running once it's fully passed. 
and get the money into the pockets of Vermonters. Next, Secretary Curley and Commissioner Goldstein will share details on phase two of our package, which is a total of $90 million that's focused on long-term economic recovery. So here's the bottom line. If we don't act now to save our businesses and these jobs, the budget gaps we're facing today will just be the tip of the iceberg and we'll face systemic losses in revenue for years to come. I believe we can come out on the other side of this crisis stronger than we were before. But we have to be selfless, strategic, and smart in order to do so. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Curley. Good morning. Thank you, Governor. When we announced the first phase of this economic relief and recovery plan, our goal was to work collaboratively towards real solutions. We engaged with hundreds of businesses and community leaders in various sectors of our economy and those hardest hit by the COVID crisis. The resulting plan was intended to do several things, bring immediate cash and technical assistance to businesses on the brink of bankruptcy, keep struggling Vermonters in their homes, and bring increased spending power to Vermonters so they could support their local businesses. For phase two, we again collaborated with communities, businesses, and other state agencies, and today we will outline another $90 million in economic support. Commissioner Goldstein will be speaking about the specifics of our plan to support additional financial assistance, housing and community recovery, broadband expansion, and regulatory modernization. Phase two is an investment in the future of Vermont, helping businesses and communities find a path forward after phase one looked to invest $310 million to keep them from going under. That phase one money was intended to cast a wide net we wanted to be inclusive of all sectors of our economy harmed by this crisis. We created three entry points for financial aid so that every business could potentially tap into the relief they needed to survive. To date, none of the phase money has reached Vermonters on the brink of collapse. The teams at ACCD and other agencies have been engaging with the legislature for nearly three weeks. And current legislation, as the governor mentioned, being considered divides our proposed wide net into much smaller parts. This fractioned approach is taking much longer and will initially deliver less than half of the financial support that was originally proposed. These business owners employ Vermonters, fill our vibrant downtowns with entrepreneurial spirit, and keep tax dollars flowing that are used to educate our kids, fix our roads, and provide support to our most vulnerable Vermonters. This crisis, even once we are through it, is going to focus us to create new and innovative economy that can withstand and thrive even through the worst of times. Phase two of this total $400 million investment is a first step. There will be much work to do in the months and years ahead, but we cannot be effective in doing that without first ensuring that our businesses survive. Rents are due, fixed costs are mounting, and the burden is growing each day. We cannot wait any longer. Our businesses and their employees need us. For our historic downtowns, rural landscapes, and city centers to return and remain full of life, we need to start getting money out the door now. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Goldstein now to talk more about the plan to help Vermont thrive in the wake of this crisis. Thank you, Secretary Curley. I'd like to add a little context. Um, more than a month ago, we were putting the finishing touches on the governor's $400 million economic relief plan. The Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Department of Economic Development, right from the get-go, were at the epicenter of incoming messages regarding business closures, limited reopenings, and alas, the consequent pain and suffering of those who are in dire need and dire fear of their livelihoods vanishing right before their very eyes. 
The anguish is palpable, evident in every phone call and email. People in business for generations, over 40 years, and through recessions, through thick and thin, just could not foresee how they were going to make it through this crisis. We spent the first few weeks after the passage of the CARES Act promoting the Paycheck Protection Program and other federal relief efforts, but it became abundantly clear that that was not the solution for all businesses. We needed to see what, what could the state do to fill the gaps um, using our federal coronavirus relief funds to direct aid to those impacted by COVID-19. The guidance issued by Treasury clearly spells out as an example that grants to help businesses recover from the losses they face due to the business interruption is uh, an allowable, uh, permissible uh, use. That much is abundantly clear. So that is how we came up with the previously announced $310 million. There was nothing capricious, nothing whim about the ask, all very intentional and thought through. ACCD is on the front line of the need. Um, businesses and nonprofits are directly asking us for help. Sector groups and trade associations, legislators all directed their inquiries from their constituencies and municipalities. All roads led to ACCD. We can all agree that government has a role in helping businesses recover, but where we differ perhaps is in the scale of the help. This is not just a handout. This is about preserving the parts of the economy that we have the ability to help. This is about injecting liquidity into the economy, the flow of funds. It is about rebuilding the structure of the economy. Businesses help to create the revenue upon which the state budget is built. If we limit the funds to help them, we are limiting the state's recovery. They need us, but actually we need them. So I'm here to reiterate our need for the governor's ask of the full 310 million that was introduced weeks ago, but also to reintroduce our ideas on the phase two of the plan, which is the remaining 90 million. This includes 55 million in financial assistance in the forms of grants and also some seed capital to start up businesses, businesses that are pre-venture or pre-revenue stage. In phase one, just for point of comparison, we asked for $250 million in financial assistance, and early next week we're expected to see the $70 million grant package from the legislature passing, knowing full well that it will not be nearly enough. Irrespective of this, we are proposing an additional grant funds to provide an inevitably oversubscribed program with more funding so businesses will have access to assistance. The second part of the package is the pandemic has revealed the absolute necessity of broadband availability and access. It has the power to keep people safe during the public health emergency. Vermonters who have internet access could work from home, could stay safe, could work, uh, could do remote learning, could get, still get health care through telehealth. Um, we're aware that 23% of our state, close to 70,000 business and residences have um, insufficient broadband. We have included $20 million in broadband expansion program to connect the last mile, bridge the affordability gap, and streamline the po processing of poll licensing applications to ensure that businesses and families have continued access necessary to adapt to this new way of life. This is also a small part of the overall broadband um, plan that was submitted by the Public Service Department. We are also proposing $11 million investment in community and housing recovery. There is mortgage assistance that is necessary for Vermont homeowners in need. We know that providing limited financial assistance now, we could prevent home foreclosures in the future and keep families in their home. We've also created a Better Places Vermont Fund that will provide help to our downtown and villages with necessary capacity and materials to convert some of their streets, parking areas, and perhaps public space to reconfigure for the new normal. The final piece is a, a regulatory streamlining package that is intended to enhance our economic recovery by modernizing Vermont's regulatory programs and environmental permitting tools. These investments will accelerate the transition of a program administration from primarily paper-based to web-based and digitizing many of the um, permit processing functions. I want to be clear that we refer to this as phase one and phase two, 
and perhaps people have heard the legislature has referred to tier one and two, tier two with a little bit different timeline. We really can't afford to wait. Um, regardless of semantics, this is a $400 million package intended to allow our businesses and economy to survive and thrive. The goal has always been to inject $400 million immediately into our economy and into our communities to spur the necessary economic activity that will make up for the tax revenue we've lost. We cannot make businesses and communities wait any longer for the relief and lifeline they have been waiting for. Vermont needs this substantial investment so that we may help businesses rehire those who are now unemployed, vitalize our communities that are now very vacant, and create the revenues upon which our budget is built. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Commissioner Goldstein. I'm Mike Pichak, Commissioner at the uh, Vermont Department of Financial Regulation and have been leading uh, Vermont's uh, COVID-19 data and modeling team uh, for the past few months. Uh, this week's data uh, and modeling update will again uh, start by reviewing our most uh, recent data from the past week, again with particular focus on the Winooski-Burlington uh, uh, community outbreak. Uh, I will then provide an update uh, on our four key reopening metrics that we continue to monitor closely and update weekly. Uh, I will then um, finally provide an update on our regional data that we've been focused on for the past month or so uh, with an update on our regional travel map as well. As always, for those watching at home, you can find today's presentation on our department's website, dfr.vermont.gov, under our COVID-19 resource page. Last week, uh, the most significant aspect of Vermont's data was the outbreak in Winooski, and that continues to be the case this week. Over the past week, we saw 84 new confirmed cases in Vermont, with at least 38 of those cases traced back to the Winooski-Burlington community outbreak. We need more time to analyze the outbreak and how many more of those cases might be connected to it. But again, for some important context, our northern uh, New England neighbors of New Hampshire and Maine continue to see case growth that is uh, far more, uh, far higher than Vermont, uh, with Maine uh, having 219 cases in the past week uh, and New Hampshire 383 new cases. So again, I think that's just important uh, context for Vermonters to consider uh, as we see uh, the rising cases related uh, to the outbreak uh, in Winooski and Burlington. I think it's also useful to review the regional dynamic heat map uh, that we've presented a few times. Uh, the heat map generally illustrates the number of new confirmed cases on a week by ba week basis since the start of the pandemic. Again, as we've explained in the past, the highlight, uh, the highlight of the map is really the fact that the virus is shown to be spreading from metro to New York, New York to other metro areas, uh, to suburban areas, and then finally to rural areas, and then largely starting to recede uh, from many of those places. Again, for Vermont, I think the heat map also helps demonstrate that the recent case, case activity uh, is centered in Chittenden County, uh, and the rest of Vermont's counties continue to experience uh, low case growth. So again, some important uh, context. Uh, also important to remember that our testing also remains high. Uh, the most uh, recent days are showing that the state continues to surpass its 100 tests uh, uh, occurred target. Uh, and to date, we have uh, tested nearly uh, 50,000 Vermonters, uh, which again is a great uh, threshold and milestone and important context to remember how much our testing capacity has increased uh, over the recent uh, months. Again, however, due to all of these factors, uh, the statewide case count uh, increase does make us continue to deviate from our best case uh, scenario that was run on May 12th. Uh, we have not run an additional forecast due to the fact that the outbreak obviously does skew our data. It skews data, for example, like our doubling rate, which now stands at eight weeks uh, compared to 12 weeks last week. Uh, but again, I think more important helpful context, when you look at the total cases per capita for Vermont, uh, we still rank in the top 10 in terms of the lowest number of cases per capita, currently sitting at seven uh, nationally. So even though our data does get skewed by these factors, it's important to look, I think, more globally and holistically uh, at some of these more stable factors uh, like the, the percentage of uh, new cases per capita or our four restart metrics that we'll go into uh, next. 
So again, turning to the restart metrics, I think this is again important for context. These are metrics that we've been monitoring during our restart Vermont uh, process. We've been really focused on, you know, how are these indicators trending? Uh, and we've also set up guardrails for each of them that tell us, you know, when should we be concerned that a certain target or multiple targets uh, are either trending in the wrong direction or passing uh, a certain guardrail or warning flag that we've established for ourselves. Again, currently these metrics, these four metrics continue to perform well uh, and they do not uh, have any signal of trouble at this time. First, uh, I want to point out Vermont syndromic surveillance. Uh, which is a measure of the percentage of Vermonters reporting COVID-like symptoms to emergency rooms and urgent care facilities. This continues to hold stable, trending below 2% uh, down to even 1%, uh, but trending within that very low uh, uh, percentage threshold. Um, and again, it's well below our 4% guardrail that we've established for ourselves. Uh, and again, this is important when considering that syndromic surveillance is one of the early uh, indicators uh, and warning signals of uh, challenges to come. We also see this week a, a slight uptake, uptick in our three to seven day viral growth averages, but again, somewhat expected given the community outbreak. But again, the growth rate remains below 1.5%, uh, and we do not have the sustained level of viral growth that would be a cause for concern at this time. So again, even though this rate has increased, it's not the sustained level of growth, uh, nor is the RT rate to a degree uh, that we would be uh, concerned that this signals broader uh, community or statewide uh, case growth that we should be concerned about. Our third data point is the percentage of COVID-19 tests that come back positive. Uh, here we can see that the outbreak uh, associated, the associated outbreak does cause the numbers to spike, but that those numbers have come back down and the three-day average continues to hover around 1%. Again, here we've established a guardrail of a 5% uh, percent positive tests coming back. Uh, which is well below the threshold of 10% that the World Health Organization has provided uh, in terms of guidance uh, as to indicating whether a particular region uh, has sufficient testing uh, and has the virus under control. Our fourth metric uh, regards uh, ICU capacity. Uh, we're glad to report again that here the ICU remains free of any patients with COVID-19 uh, and that our overall ICU, ICU usage remains well below our 30% threshold that we have established, putting our hospitals in a strong position to properly treat Vermonters uh, if that need ever arises. Again, taken together, these metrics provide the best insight on our progress during restart, uh, and uh, we continue to watch them very closely, but they do not signal any troubling signs as of today. Transitioning to our regional data, the next slide compares new cases over the last two weeks for each of our northeastern states. Again, you can see the relative number of cases Vermont has compared to our neighbors. Uh, but again, looking at this as on a regional basis, there is good news. 35% case reduction week over week from last week. So our region has seen significant improvement. Again, we have an updated version of our drive time map, which illustrates uh, certain data within a driving distance of Vermont's borders. Currently, there are still an estimated 135,000 active cases within a five hour drive of Vermont's borders, which should obviously make us still look at this with caution, but it is also a 16% reduction in active cases from last week. And I think that leads us well into our travel map discussion because as we pointed out last week, not every region of, our, of, our, of the Northeast has the same level of risk when we're talking about uh, current active cases. Last week, we did announce the first step in our leisure travel policy guidance. Uh, and presented an interactive map to help Vermonters and visitors better understand which counties are no longer subject to the 14-day quarantine. Since our presentation last Friday, seven additional counties have moved below the 400 active case threshold, uh, equaling about an additional million individuals who can travel to Vermont without quarantine restrictions. Again, there are now 62 counties with 4.6 million residents no longer subject to Vermont's quarantine. Further, we also saw nine counties move from red to yellow uh, in the past week, but we did see three counties move from green uh, to yellow. But again, on a net basis, we saw an additional million people uh, that are now no longer subject to the quarantine, an additional seven counties as well. And we'll point out that almost the entire state of Maine, but for two counties, uh, is now sub not subject to the Vermont uh, quarantine. 
Uh, additionally, last week we did announce the second step, which b becomes effective on Monday. Uh, that allows uh, travelers from visiting Vermont from any county uh, to come so under a revised quarantine requirement. Uh, the revised quarantine requirement focuses on uh, quarantining at home for those individuals that would like to quarantine at home for seven days and then get a COVID-19 test that comes back negative. They're allowed to drive to Vermont, uh, stay in, in Vermont and do leisure travel, visit friends or family without a quarantine. Uh, separately, uh, uh, individuals can travel into the state, stay at a lodging establishment for the purposes of quarantining. Uh, they could do that for the traditional 14 days, uh, or they can quarantine for seven days and then get a negative test. There's more guidance about that on ACCD's website, but I think it's important to note that not only is step one uh, available for those that are in the counties that no longer require quarantine, uh, but now as of uh, Monday, that second step will be available uh, that provides a revised quarantine uh, for all uh, individuals uh, in the Northeast. I do also want to talk uh, just a minute about the travel map that we talked about. There has been some confusion that I think would be worth uh, clarifying. Uh, so for those that try to you know, calculate their local county or uh, their local uh, community, um, it's important to remember that we are focused on active cases, not total cases. There's a big difference between those two. And all instances, total cases will be significantly higher than the current active cases a community is ex experiencing. Uh, active cases is a better example of the current risk that a particular location uh, has. Uh, total cases largely came from March and April. Uh, those individuals have uh, recovered, uh, so they're no longer uh, a threat of transmitting the virus to those that might be around them. So I think that's an important distinction for people to remember. This is an active case count, uh, not a total case count. Uh, and then when we're talking about the active case count at the county level, uh, we did put out a methodology this week that's on our department website for those that are interested. Active cases requires us to apply um, an estimate to arrive at a number because the counties and the states around us do not provide that data on a county by county basis. So we created a reliable methodology that allows us to make a estimate of the active cases that are around us based on information uh, and data from Johns Hopkins University. So I do encourage others that are interested in learning more about that uh, to uh, read that methodology uh, and reach out to our department uh, with any further questions. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we will continue to monitor our statewide data closely and also the Winooski Burlington outbreak uh, closely as well and hope to have additional forecasts uh, next week. Um, and I just want to again thank Vermonters for their patience and their sacrifices and their continued commitment to get through this together. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Commissioner Levine. Thank you. Just have a few brief comments today to update people on the outbreak and a few comments on testing. Uh, first, I want to just um, again recognize the fantastic uh, collaboration that the health department and the state have had with city officials in Winooski and Burlington, and just a plethora of community partners that are all working with us in terms of testing residents, tracing contacts, really all the ingredients to help contain this outbreak. As of last evening, the total number of cases associated with the outbreak was 81. Again, the breakdown between adult and children is about 60% adult, 40% children. Close to 80% again are related to Winooski and about 15% with Burlington. Small number of residents elsewhere in Chittenden County. We continue on a daily basis to show that about one in five individuals actually have symptoms at the time they're identified as a positive test. We've said before and I'll say again that uh, with a large number that are asymptomatic, uh, this may be a contributing factor to how the virus can spread in the community. And it's a reminder though that overall, the prevalence of positive tests as you just saw in the data is very, very low. The virus is still obviously still circulating. Lest we think the virus is totally benign, 
Fortunately, there are no deaths associated with this outbreak, but we did have our first recorded hospitalization. We're happy to again announce that everyone associated with the outbreak, whether they've been identified as a case or a contact, have been incredibly cooperative with regards to helping prevent further spread. I would like all Vermonters to continue to use what I like to term universal precautions, though, which of course are keeping the six foot or more distancing between one another, wearing a facial covering, obviously washing your hands as often as possible, and definitely staying at home if feeling ill. A little bit about testing. Rough estimate of tests done just in Burlington and Winooski alone at the pop-up sites we've run through last night was over 3,000. I suspect by the time we get through the day, we'll be in the close to 3,500 range. Test sites in those communities continue to be scheduled on a daily basis. We, of course, also have pop-up sites in other regions of the state that are continuing on their schedule. And refer to, refer to humanresources.vermont.gov slash pop-ups or call 211 if you're interested in uh, a location of a test site near you or want to schedule an appointment at one. Just to call out a couple other points about testing, we just completed testing at our sixth and final correctional facility, the Southern State facility. All tests were negative there. It's been a strategic part of our approach to testing high-risk, vulnerable uh, facilities or populations. And I continue to not yet be aware of a positive test associated with a protest anywhere in the state. Thank you. Thank you all. I will now open it up for questions. Robin? All right, thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, so, Governor, uh, regarding the economic stimulus package, uh, I'm wondering what conversations you had with the speaker in the pro tem and uh, where that, that disconnect is uh, in terms of the emergency. Yeah, well, I'm not sure there's a a disconnect other than their approach is different. Um, I, I think the speaker and the, the pro tem, I'm not sure that they're on the same page either, but I know uh, that they have an interest in trying to preserve some money in hopes that there'll be some flexibility from the federal government to utilize this money uh, to fulfill the budgetary problem that we have in the state of Vermont. That doesn't exist today. Uh, but what I do know exists today is that these businesses and jobs are, are, are impacted. Uh, and if we don't fix this now, we're going to have this systemic problem in years to come. I mean, it's just, it just seems so basic to me that if we don't protect the businesses now and protect those jobs that are associated with those businesses, uh, that uh, a year or two from now, we'll be suffering. It'll be almost a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, to, uh, to neglect it now. Uh, we will have, we'll be impacted a couple years from now. But if we do this right, and uh, preserve those businesses, give them a lifeline, uh, then we'll be able to, uh, to be able to, you know, get through the hump, so to speak, uh, the budgetary hump, and, uh, and then have our uh, economy back to normal in, in another year or so. And I'm also wondering, um, so with a lot of these CARES Act dollars that we'll be spending, the money has to be spent by the end of the year. Um, your administration is proposing a lot of like broadband and housing projects. Um, the time construction season clock is ticking. I'm wondering if you, if you uh, believe there will be enough time to get a lot of these problems. Well, there, there will be, uh, I believe, there will be if we act now. Uh, obviously, if we wait a month or two months, um, we may run out of time. Um, but, uh, but I feel uh, the proposals we put forward are doable, and we'll be able to hit the ground running just as soon as they, they pass something uh, and then move forward. I think. You know, Vermonters expect us to do something to help uh, the economy now, and, and we have an opportunity to do so. Stuart? Question about the, uh, the 
number of issues, the cases that are rising in 20 plus states. I mean, we've had uh, 100, almost 100 new cases this week in Vermont. But are we seeing a second wave already uh, as we look to reopening uh, more here? Can we take some cues from what we're already seeing in so many other states? Um, I may refer to Dr. Levine on that. It's a great question. I'm always asked, are we going to have a resurgence? And the answer is yes. But is this the resurgence? I don't think so. Um, you know, most experts in public health and in the field of viruses, virology, feel that the resurgence will come after the summer. Uh, some who have a greater degree of self-confidence are saying the fall. Others are saying just after the summer, could be fall, could be winter, could be a combination of both. Will it be a resurgence, or will it be a bunch of small little peaks that over time get contained and then reoccur, et cetera? Unclear. But what we're seeing around the country right now in many of the 20 plus states that are seeing uh, increases in their viral numbers is really a continuation of their original experience with the virus. Some are being criticized for reopening too quickly. Some are being criticized for making the wrong moves in the way that they chose to uh, restart, restart their states. Um, but actually, others are having good luck. And people predicted they would have a bad experience, and they haven't yet shown that. But you know, even in New England, you hear that you know, the number of cases that we just commented on happening in states adjoining ours, there are still efforts being made to reopen in a very strategic and hopefully safe way. But they've had a lot of experience with virus activity going on still. I think the thing about our curve that's so much different is we were, for a couple of weeks, so low in our test positivity and our new cases that this outbreak looks very dramatic in the context of that data. But it still is a, a, a true outbreak in one particular part of the state uh, with a lot of factors behind it that, to me, just indicates the virus is still amongst us. It was suppressed, but it's always here. And as we've said, it's in the air we breathe uh, that we all share. So the, the reality is. I wouldn't want to label this Vermont's resurgence of COVID-19. Um, this is just part of our experience with it from the outset. And um, this isn't what I think resurgence is going to look like. Steve? Yeah, Governor, uh, as to your uh, phase two now of uh, the recovery, um, you have been fairly generous, I think, with the uh, with the communication between you and the legislature uh, and, and saying that the legislature has taken a different tact and, and such. But given the situation, is this, are you still writing this off as not political? Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, it's political. I think it's just a, uh, a different approach. Uh, and again, I, um, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of the guidance with the CARES Act, uh, whether this money will be able to be utilized to backfill our budgets. Uh, but, um, but I'm not sure that, that seems so short-sighted to me, uh, because even if we could backfill our own uh, budgets, uh, the, the problem is we don't have the businesses with the jobs uh, to sustain uh, those budgets over time. So um, it's just different, a uh, different philosophical approach. Uh, I believe that we need to, to take care of the problem today, uh, not wait uh, again uh, for next uh, uh, in six months from now, and then a year from now, and then a year and a half from now. Uh, this is the time to rebuild this foundation today, the economic foundation today, uh, because we can, we can see it in real time. We can, you know, you, you don't have to go very far to talk to some of these uh, businesses and some of the, the employees uh, who are not working today because the businesses are impacted because through no fault of their own, aren't able to open fully. So it's having, a, having an impact on all of us in Vermont, uh, but it's just a, a philosophical difference. And uh, as to reopening, 
Uh, Governor Sununu has uh, really taken a more aggressive, it seems now, tact. Uh, his numbers are looking a little bit better. But um, it doesn't concern you that he's uh, opening up as large as he is, uh, spectator sports, uh, uh, restaurants, and, and inns uh, fully? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I know that he had had an announcement yesterday, and I haven't. I don't know the details of the announcement, but uh, some of with the restaurants and so forth, uh, we were working uh, along the same uh, approach. Uh, but he uh, he took it a step further. Uh, we'll see whether he's right or not. Uh, we'll learn from that, uh, just like we are everything else. Uh, but we do share a border, uh, and uh, we do um, share a lot. Uh, you know, in terms of people. Uh, going back and forth, and and uh, I hope he's right. Uh, I hope he doesn't see uh, an additional spike, uh, but uh, but we'll wait and see. Will that affect uh, your decisions as to maybe shutting down a couple of counties or whatever? Yeah, I mean, we'll continue to update uh, the data uh, and make sure that we're protecting Vermonters uh, the best we can. Uh, so that's why we've taken the approach we have uh, to, to isolate to different counties. If you see an outbreak, uh, uh, you know, a sustainable outbreak in a certain county, uh, we may de indeed uh, shut that county uh, down so that we can, again, protect Vermonters the best we can. All right, moving to the phone, start with Pat at WCAS. I know, Governor, you've indicated that you're going to re-extend the state of emergency on Monday for another month. Someone had written into me wanting to know what it would take to lift all of our COVID restrictions. Like, what would our data have to look like to do that? And what's the benchmark you've set for that? Well, again, it's something that we're doing in time. Uh, again, watching all the data, the regional data as well, seeing some of the other entities. We rely so heavily on tourism in the state. Uh, and, and by the way, I mean, we haven't even opened up the border with Canada, which is, you know, that's, that's a huge sector for us, uh, and they've been heavily impacted. I've heard that they are going to extend uh, the border restrictions uh, for a longer period uh, than, you know, I think it was June 21st, but now it's been extended, or it's going to be extended. Um, so that, in some respects, uh, hurts and helps us. Uh, it, uh, it hurts us from an economic standpoint, but helps us uh, in terms of the pandemic and not having to to be concerned about uh, more uh, of the transmission from our from our north, uh, so you know it all depends on the factors. Uh, it all depends on the numbers, the ma the modeling, the data, and the science. Uh, and again, uh, Commissioner Pichek uh, keeps uh, showing the heat map, and uh, and the numbers are looking better in Massachusetts and New York. Uh, but I can I can tell you that uh, you know, Connecticut, New Jersey. Uh, they aren't out of the woods yet either, uh, Rhode Island. Um, so we just have to watch the data because we are so heavily impacted uh, because we, we rely on them for our economy, uh, but at the same time, uh, they can impact, you know, the transmission of, of the disease as well. So there isn't a clear benchmark then for, like, we will, we will lift our restrictions when, you know, let's say um, there's X percentage of cases nationwide or in our region or something like that. Well, I mean, again, I guess we're, we're just looking for like, what is the, you know, not when is the end goal, but like, what does it look like? Well, again, I think what you've seen over the last even week uh, with the modeling, uh, opening up more counties, more area, uh, I think we'll continue to see that. We, we, every uh, week we've been opening up more of the sectors, doing a little bit at a time to make sure we're not taking the right approach. So we're moving in the right direction. We haven't had to take any steps back at this point. Uh, and again, methodically moving forward, opening up the different sectors, we'll get to 100% uh, within, you know, uh, hopefully within uh, the next two or three months. Uh, but, uh, but again, we'll base that on the data that we're seeing at that point in time. Okay, so mostly I was trying to confirm whether it was we need to wait for a vaccine or whether we're going to reopen everything and lift all the restrictions. No, you know, I, I, I don't think we can. We can't wait for a vaccine. I mean, that would be um, that would be the best case scenario if a, a, a vaccine magically appeared and and uh, could solve this uh, problem for all of us. But but I don't think we can you know wait for that. Uh, what we're doing, as we've seen in Winooski. Um, basing uh, it on uh, increased testing and, and tracing abilities, enhancing that, building upon that, learning uh, from, you know, 
to be perfectly frank, mistakes we may have made in the past, other uh, states have made in the past, basing it on uh, some of some of what they've done well, what we've done well, and, and enhancing that. So if we can increase, continue to increase our testing and tracing abilities, when we see an outbreak, uh, we won't have to shut down the whole state. Uh, we'll be able to just concentrate on that one area uh, and make sure that we contain it, box it in, uh, so that we don't have uh, any outbreaks in other regions of our state either. So we've learned a lot, and I believe that uh, we'll be able to, again, uh, somewhat uh, mitigate this, control this uh, within the state without having to to, to back up uh, and uh, take some of the severe steps that we took initially. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good morning. Uh, wondering uh, what the state of Vermont can do to increase mask wearing by those looking to deal with the state of Vermont. Uh, this morning I got an email from a state worker asking why the state is not making any attempt to screen members of the general public when they come into state office buildings. No questions, no temperature taking, no nothing. And as this employee noted, restrictions have been put on businesses by, I guess, ACDD uh, and others, but, but quote, not their own state government. And as a side note, uh, I got two delivery guys from Ferrell distributing, hopping and popping, unloading a big truck in a small store, made multiple trips into a convenience store <clears throat> to deposit products, packing them on the floor, and neither had a mask. Same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Same thing this morning. Another Ferrell delivery truck doing the same thing at a Colchester store. Can liquor control step in and insist that beverage distributors? Wear masks, and what about the health department for other food deliveries to keep uh, Vermonters and clerks safe in those situations? Yeah, you, you've you've got a lot there, uh, Mike, and I'll try and answer a few of those. Uh, we do have guidance within ACCD in terms of uh, employers and what our expectations are uh, for uh, those employers. In terms of the the state, um, uh, you know, em employees, uh, we're still working out the details of that. I don't know if uh, Suzanne. Secretary Young is on uh, the line, but uh, but I, you know, we're we're developing a policy for reopening uh, as we speak uh, and uh, trying to get ready for that and what it will look like. Uh, I'm not sure at this point, but um, it will re require um, some uh, social or uh, physical distancing and so forth. Uh, Secretary Young. Uh, thank you, Governor. And there was some guidance put out in terms of um, screening for uh, state employees when they come to work. Uh, there, I, I guess I would be interested in a follow-up conversation with um, Mike about what particular uh, departments or agencies have concerns about um, their interactions with the public, because I, um, you know, we we are trying to balance. Uh, the safety of our employees and those who, who interact with our employees and following the guidance that ACCD has put forth. Uh, we are um, actually, you know, I would like to just say that state employees have been on the job um, since the beginning of the pandemic in many different ways. Many, many are telecommuting, so they um, have been able to continue their job. Other employees that actually return to the work site, um, as your guidance has allowed them to, depending on what sector they're working in, and we have um, directed them to all follow the guidance from ACCD in terms of interactions in the office space and with uh, the public generally. So I, I would like to um, maybe do some follow up with Mike and find out where there is a concern. I think this is more about the public coming in not that the employees are wear, wearing masks, but more about the general public are just walking into state offices uh, from what I got from the email. Okay, well, I would be interested, I guess, to know if, if which, which offices are. I'm going okay. to, I'm so going to ask. Uh, up. I could try to answer your question. I'm going to ask Dr. Levine and maybe Secretary Curley weigh in as well. I just want to uh, give a personal experience. And that is every day I get out of my car in the parking garage on Cherry Street to go upstairs to my office. 
before I even get to the elevator, there are abundant signages that are telling me exactly what symptoms I should be uh, informing someone about and not coming to work with. There are uh, signs regarding that uh, I need to be wearing facial covering. Um, and then I get on the elevator, and in the elevator I have more signs saying the same thing. Um, so that's a state office building, and clearly employees of the state and public are being informed about uh, what the rules are, so to speak. And uh, Secretary Curley, do you have it? Thank you. And they walk right by those signs all the time. I've seen them at stores saying you must have a mask to come in the store, and people walk in, and the store clerks don't want to lose the customers. So, you know. Yeah, uh, Mike, this is Secretary Curley. I just wanted to speak a little bit to, um, you talk about, you know, people making deliveries and employees not wearing masks. Our guidance is really clear that <laughs> employees must wear masks while in the presence of others. So, again, if, if people are seeing something that looks like it's uncomfortable, we would ask that they reach out to us because it's a great opportunity, to, uh, opportunity for us to remind folks of our guidance and, um, the expectations that, that lie within that guidance um, on our website. As far as um, customers, you know, employers or, or business owners are able to require folks to wear masks, but again, if, if they choose not to enforce it, um, you know, that's not something we can necessarily control. Um, we can just encourage it and encourage the public to do it for the sake of others. Um, as far as the, um, the state of Vermont as the employer, our teams, um, as Secretary Young mentioned, we've been uh, developing our, our restart plans in terms of, of when our employees might go back into their offices. Right now, we're, we're taking the approach that if we can work remotely, we are working remotely in hopes that um, we can get other sectors more broadly open. But for those areas of state government that are open, the guidelines are the same, whether they work for the state of Vermont as an employer or any other employer. So. If um, there are areas where we need to tighten up and give more education, we're happy to do that as well. Okay, and one quick follow to the governor. By all accounts, you've been putting in an incredible number of hours each week, uh, each day, each week on COVID and little time for anything else for the past three months. Uh, Thunder Road is gonna open on June 18th. Uh, do you think you'll be able to take a few hours off and put number 14 on the racetrack that night? <laughs> Yeah, that and have a little fun. Yeah, nice, <laughs> nice thought. But uh, no, that isn't in the in the plans. We're still in a state of emergency, and until that's over, um, my my racing days are over. Thank you, Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes. Good morning. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the money that you were talking about earlier on in this conversation? and where it's going to come from and how are you going to replenish that amount of money that you're going to be sending out and we are also hearing from people who want to know when individuals will be able to visit um, family members and friends in correctional facilities and long-term care facilities um chris i'll answer the second part of that uh, first uh, in terms of the long-term care facilities uh, we are uh, wrapping up uh, some of the guidelines and some of the details uh, as we speak. We'll have an announcement uh, on, uh, I would say, Wednesday uh, of this next week on, uh, on some of the long-term care facilities and hospitals. Um, in terms of the money, I, I, I just want to make sure that I understand the question, but we received uh, the $1.25 billion as well as a few other dollars in other uh, sectors, other uh, parts of legislation. Uh, that's where the money uh, that we are uh, anticipating spending is coming from. It's the Congressional Act uh, that was passed, uh, and, uh, and we are using that money uh, for this economic relief package uh, that, uh, that we talked about, uh, as well as the you know, first phase and second phase. So that was a $400 million uh, package uh, that we put forth, uh, but as well there's going to be health care, uh, as well as the emergency itself, uh, education, uh, and other initiatives uh, that will, you know, well exceed uh, the 1.25 billion. Does that answer your question, or is it more specific? No, it does. I'm just wondering if the state will have to pay that back, or 
how would that could be replenished? No, that's a that's a grant. Um, the only way we'd have to uh, return the money is if we uh, misspent it, uh, misappropriated it, and and so far that's what some of my resistance in terms of of waiting on the uh, utilizing it for our budgetary uh, concerns because. They're quite clear uh, in the guidance that it cannot uh, be used uh, to to fulfill any budget shortfalls. It has to be for COVID-related expenses, and that's the guidance we're we're moving forward with. Um, so any misuse of that uh, uh, would have would be clawed back uh, by the federal government, and we'd have to pay it back. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, just before I asked too much, I wanted to ask if there was an update on employment with, uh, with USCIS. On Wednesday, you said, yeah. or your staff said that they would get back to me. Uh, have you heard anything? We, we, did, uh, we did reach out uh, to the Congre Congressional de Delegation, uh, Senator Leahy in particular, uh, and uh, it, it does appear uh, that there may be a furlough uh, due to uh, a few things, uh, the border being shut down, uh, lack of immigration, uh, into the state and so forth. So uh, it does appear. I don't know the magnitude. I don't know the details uh, at this point. Uh, we're waiting uh, for them to get back to us on that. But it does appear uh, you were correct uh, that there is going to be some sort of furlough. So uh, what is the state doing uh, to prepare for that? Because we, well, we've got yeah, again, a number we need, of questions yeah. since we asked that question. We, we need to get the details of it. Obviously, uh, we'll be uh, taking care of that. I don't know what the furlough would look like, whether there was uh, any pay involved in, in terms of uh, the federal government, uh, but we do uh, still have uh, the unemployment uh, assistance uh, and they would be able to be signed up. We would uh, then uh, treat them like uh, anyone else and try to find opportunities for them. Uh, but this, again, uh, puts a, a highlight on we need to uh, provide relief for some of the the sectors within the state uh, in terms of the economic relief in some of the businesses so that we, you know, before this uh, pandemic, uh, we had the lowest unemployment in the country and we actually had a shortage of uh, people for all the jobs we had available. Uh, so uh, that isn't the case today, uh, but we want to return to that. So we want to preserve uh, the businesses and, and uh, jobs here in Vermont uh, so that we can uh, put people back to work. So. I don't have all the answers on that. We're still working uh, along those uh, those lines, trying to find out what the magnitude. Nobody has uh, told us what that means, how many people um, it could entail. Um, so uh, until we have those details, hard to know how to react. But we do have, um, you know, our unemployment and our labor department uh, ready, willing, and able uh, whenever that occurs. All right, and then uh, I have a question and a follow-up to some of the data that was presented earlier. Um, the House is currently working on legislation pertaining to mail-in voting. Uh, there's some arguing as to aspects of that bill. Uh, one, of the, one of the debates is whether uh, candidates, campaigns, 501c4 organizations should be able to handle voters' ballots. Would you like to see a provision in the bill that would disallow those types of people from handling ballots? And would you consider a veto uh, if if there are aspects with that, that would allow people with conflicts of interest from handling ballots? Well, I, I think the legislature made it quite clear that they uh, have their own thoughts on the election in November. Um, so we'll let this uh, work its way through the, the process. I don't know about any of the details, but I do know that they're taking me out of this, uh, which is fine. Uh, so um, we'll just have to see what's what's passed uh, when it uh, when it comes to be. Okay, and then uh, quick follow up on the data you guys shared earlier. Uh, I see that Chittenden County is about twice the case lo uh, load that would allow for traveling if Chittenden County were outside of the state. Uh, for those of us in, in Franklin County and the other counties that aren't Chittenden County, is it safe to travel to Chittenden County? And, you know, if so, why is it not safe to travel to, say, Albany County, New York? Um, I'll let Commissioner Pichek start with that, and maybe then Dr. Levine. 
So thank you for that question. It allows an important clarification as well. I think that we made last week, but I didn't reiterate today that the travel policy does not apply to Vermont or Vermont counties. You know, we are watching those four metrics that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, they are sort of broad statewide metrics that are um, important for us and more detailed for us as we reopen. We don't necessarily have that same level of granularity uh, with all the other states that are around us, particularly on a county by county basis. So we have much greater understanding um, and knowledge of our own cases and know that that number that increased to Chittenden County from you know 159 to 814 is related to um, that outbreak in Winooski and not necessarily at this time broader community transmission. So, um, so that's why we're not necessarily applying that same metric to us. You do see a change in the map. We did change the color of Vermont so that there is a, a difference when a state goes, or when a county rather goes over the different thresholds we've set for other uh, counties around us. But again, we're looking uh, and have a much better understanding of our data because of the more detailed um, data that we do collect and have. Uh, than we do on the other counties. So that's why we've used this active case count as a good proxy for the risk. And I'll just chime in from the public health standpoint on that. Um, bottom line is those are new cases. So they do affect the way we portray our data, obviously. Um, but as you noticed on the way that the cases were portrayed. There wasn't a vast increase going on. We were uh, on a more downward slope, which we'll continue to watch very, very closely. I remind people that there was a point in the outbreak when we had one or two long-term care facilities that had large numbers of cases. If we looked at that number of cases and said, gee, they're in Chittenden County, maybe I shouldn't go to Chittenden County, I think we would have been blowing that out of proportion. Important as those cases were to where they were, that did not indicate a countywide issue. Um, this outbreak, we believe, also is not um, a countywide issue at this point in time. And we've been watching it very closely and trying to do our best to do the containment process, as you've seen playing it out. So what I want to leave you with is words I used earlier universal precautions. Whether you're in Wyndham County or Chittenden County or Grand Isle County, I don't really care. You should be behaving the same. Same respect for all of the principles that we've put down. Um, because maybe you didn't know that Chittenden County had these new cases and you assumed it was like the rest of the state because it was before we actually knew there was an outbreak. You wouldn't have wanted to be more casual about your attention to these, these core principles about not going to work if you're sick, doing the proper hygiene, making sure you keep the appropriate distance, and making sure about the facial coverings. I've kind of said this many times, until we have the proper treatments and the proper prevention like vaccine for this virus, we kind of need to behave that way whether we were in our own borders or outside our borders uh, and traveling. And I think that's why there are so many distressing scenes portrayed by the media uh, as they go around the country looking where cases have begun to increase again and focusing their attention on the public's behavior, whether it be at a beach or in a bar or what have you. Uh, we need to pay attention to those things. It's a clear part of our new reality um, and it will come to pass. We will actually get through all of this, but we need to actually continue to pay attention. Um, just a quick follow-up. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned nursing homes. We had a reader uh, contact us with a similar comment that, uh, say in Massachusetts, for instance, if you were to take out the captive populations in nursing homes and prisons, uh, there are some of those counties that the number would be well under 400 per million. Um, and in a captive population like that, it doesn't tend to spread to the general uh, citizens in that county. So is there a better way to calculate something like that? And I'll just, I'll just leave you with that. Thanks for no, your time. No, thanks for that point. And there probably is, there are many ways we could portray data based on that. But I want you to keep in mind, 
those captive facilities, as you said, most of the time, if you're going to find an outbreak in a facility like that, it's because the people who work at these facilities, not intentionally, but are for perhaps bringing the virus in from their own experiences in their life in their communities. So again, adhering to all of the principles in your day-to-day -day life is still the uh, operative principle here at work. All right, we got to move to our next questioner, Lisa at the AP. Uh, thanks. Back to the mail-in voting. Um, have you? It's up for final approval in the House. I mean, have have you seen the legislation, and, and do you expect to sign it? I I have not seen it. Uh, so you can't say if you expect to sign it. Then uh, we'll see what it looks like in its final form. What I said before was if it was. Uh, to take me out of the equation, uh, to put it in the hands of the uh, Secretary of State, uh, I wouldn't stand in its way. So if it continues to do that, uh, I, have, I have no problem with it. Okay, and then something you said earlier, you expect or you, that the state would be 100% open in the next two to three months? Uh, my, my hope would be uh, that uh, based on the data and the science, as I continue to say, uh, that we, we base all our decisions on, on what's happening on the ground. You know, I'm hopeful um, that we'll get to a point where we're open, having everything open at some point. I'm hoping uh, it's in the next two to three months. I mean, look, look how far we've come um, in some respects uh, over the first three months from shutting everything down uh, and, uh, and now reopening at least uh, to a quarter, maybe to a third at this point. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue uh, to, to follow that, that uh, path and things will get better so we can open everything up. Okay, thank you. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, I think this question is probably for Dr. Levine. Um, I was wondering, um, in the, the charts, uh, it appears that um, there have been almost no cases of COVID in the state's IC unit, units for some time. Um, I wonder, is this a function of um, the increased testing picking up a lot of uh, cases that are completely asymptomatic? Um, or are doctors getting a little bit better at treating patients when they come in so that the disease does not escalate to the point where it needs more serious measures? Challenging question, but great question. I think that part of it is um, we are seeing less active viral infection in the population. Because not only are the ICUs doing very well, which means, of course, no one's on a ventilator, but our daily count of people in the hospital with a diagnosis of COVID is in the low single digits on any given day. Occasionally, I think uh, it's been zero, but uh, very low numbers. So. Um, there are not enough people having an illness severe enough to even get in the hospital, never mind to require ICU care at that point in time. I would, um, and so yes, we are doing a lot of testing and finding that the positivity rate, in spite of an outbreak, is still very, very low. Um, and that's nice. I mean, that's kind of like what we would hope to have seen in the summer, although just on yesterday's news alone, states like Arizona and Florida, which are in sort of a heat belt, are seeing uh, vastly increasing numbers of cases that are actually getting into the hospital as well. So I wouldn't want to let thoughts about temperature or humidity be the whole explanation, because they can't be. One thing I'd like you to know that we're doing in Vermont is if you've been identified as a case we are providing you with what's called a oximeter, a simple device that you can put on your finger and understand the saturation of oxygen in your blood. Because what we've learned a lot from looking at the most severe cases in Vermont, in our experience, 
um, many of those cases seem to have, um, prior to the time that they may have died, um, had um, fainting spells, confusion, things that would indicate not enough oxygen getting to the brain. So the concern here is maybe if you can identify a person having low oxygen levels as a person living at home at that point in time before they got sicker, this would be an early warning signal to enable you to get involved with support services, perhaps oxygen, um, and try to get them through a challenging part of their illness without it graduating to a level that requires either hospital stay or an ICU and a ventilator. Um, so that's actively going on uh, right now uh, in our programming. Did I answer your question okay? Um, for the most part, so just so I can be clear, what you're saying is that there's no indication that the virus is becoming less virulent, but there's some sense that uh, even though you don't have um, treatment uh, modalities for the the most serious cases, um, you do know enough from your experience to be able to head off some of the worst effects. Yeah, that's correct. And I don't think the virus itself has changed at all, but our ability to pick up more people who have uh, an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic state, yet a positive test, of course, uh, has been enhanced by our, our strategies. So we are identifying um, a lot more of the population that isn't going to suffer as much with the virus. And if you remember back when we first started in March, everybody was talking about the fact that 80% of us are going to do fine or more, uh, and it's less than 20% that may actually end up in the hospital or have a more serious time with the illness. Uh, we still believe that to be true, but now we're learning so much more, not just in Vermont, but across the country and across the world, about the fact that the rate of people being infected but not having severe symptoms or perhaps any symptoms may be quite large so that maybe we'll have more refined numbers to report in the future regarding the 80-20 breakdown. Um, but I think that's a big part of what you've noticed looking at our data. Thank you very much. Eric, Times Argus. Yes, this question is for Secretary Smith. Uh, for the homeless population, are they going to remain in motels and hotels until a better solution is found, or is there some kind of deadline? Does the money run out at some point and these people might be back on the street without a shelter system to support them? Secretary Smith. Thank you for the question, Eric. The, the objective is not to have people on the street. That's why we're phasing this, um, this motel-hotel program uh, out. We're phasing it down uh, over the next year, as we talked about it, as, as I talked about it last time. This is a $23 million package. Um, 10 million of it would still be uh, for motels for safe housing uh, over the course of the next year. Just to put this into some sort of perspective, if we annualize the numbers we're paying, we're doing right now in terms of the homeless population in the motel hotel system, if we annualize the cost of that, that's $48 million. Pre-COVID, we were paying $6 million. So you can see the difference. So we're still spending quite a bit of money with the motel hotel program as we phase it down. But we are going to institute, as I said at the last, uh, last press conference, a whole host of other items that will uh, cost, uh, you know, 13 more million dollars as we uh, look for uh, housing for these individuals. Now, I also want to Eric, just remind you, the governor and ACCD has a, another package out here as well, $50 million. So we're talking a total of $73 million for homelessness, um, as we uh, talk about it. Those, those two uh, components are integral in terms of eliminating 
what I would say is a homeless issue that we have here in the state, plus making sure that we get people into permanent, a permanent housing situation. The motel hotel program is not sustainable and is not a long-term solution. It was great during the height of the pandemic. We got everybody off the street. But what the failure of that system is, is that we are housing people without services and it's unsustainable from a cost perspective. So I think we've got a great plan in terms of how we're going to transition this program over the next year and then involve the community partners next uh, July uh, of uh, the fiscal year uh, 22 uh, involve the community partners in how to even enhance this program as we move forward. So the answer to your question is no, we're not throwing people out on the streets. We are transitioning this program. We are pr provide, putting new requirements into this program as we move and we're moving families. We, one other thing about this, we are trying to end a family homelessness in this state. And uh, this program uh, accomplishes this. Uh, Eric, I know you didn't ask this, but I'd be remiss in not bringing a subject that's not even related to this up, but I, I, I need to. Uh, Dr. Levine and his uh, staff, it's part of the Agency of Human Services, but I just, wanna, I, I just wanna emphasize how incredible the work that they've been doing over the last two and a half weeks to a month in terms of testing and tracing. They need to be called out and congratulated for what they've done. Just the last seven days, we've done 9,326 tests. Again, 9,326 tests. That's a rolling seven day test average of 1,332 tests a day. That is amazing. That's not even talking about the con contact tracers that are where, I got my report from contact tracing last night. I believe it was 112. That's AM. Uh, so that tells you how hard they're working. So Eric, did I answer your question? Yes. Yes, I, I guess uh, we've been hearing from some advocates that are concerned that, that some homeless people might get lost along the way. So I guess, so, so they will stay in these hotels and motels for the foreseeable future until something better comes along, is that correct? Yeah, we'll be transfer, we'll be, uh, there will be people that will be, um, uh, we'll be reinstituting sort of criteria for being in a hotel motel that we had uh, prior to COVID, but w this is going to be a, a what I would call a soft transition as we're moving forward. Okay, thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, I think this is a question for Secretary Curley. Um, However, the millions of dollars in financial assistance, whether it's just the, the 70 million grant package or grants and loans does come out, how is that money going to be allocated? Is there going to be an emphasis on getting the money to small businesses? And if so, who and how um, is this going to be decided? Yeah, Ian, thank you. I'm actually going to um, pitch this to Commissioner Goldstein, who has really worked the details out with this. So she's, she's right here. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, we are working, uh, as, as I speak, we are working with various, you know, the tax department and others to come up with um, a methodology to ensure that we are getting the need, the, the assistance out to those who most need it in as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So anticipate that there will be a ceiling in terms of annual revenue beyond which may not be eligible. So we are gearing this toward the smaller businesses um, uh, on, you know, by design. Did that answer you? Some of it, well, somewhat. I know um, you know well that some of the PPP money, there's been a lot of concern that it went to a lot of big businesses that didn't necessarily need it, um, where the very small businesses were kind of left out for various reasons. Uh, they either didn't have the infrastructure or the staff available to apply um, or they didn't qualify for one reason or another. So now small businesses are concerned, are we still not going to qualify? Let's say it's a one-person business. How will you, how will you uh, 
be able to reach them? And how will you make those determinations? Sure. And first, let me say that I think some of that uh, reporting had been a little bit overemphasized because we know in Vermont nearly 12,000 businesses were able to access PPP. And some of the small businesses we've been working with have been able to access that. So let me just make that uh, point. The other is that we do have a proposal in for technical assistance providers, and we are anticipating working with partners who particularly work with micro businesses, small businesses, and local businesses. So we are, we think we have the, the bases covered. We are going to do outreach in addition to appearing here, for example, also on our social media, um, as well as our email, which if you haven't signed up, people should sign up for ACCD. Vermont.gov. There's a section to sign up for our COVID newsletter. It goes out three days a week. Um, so we are amply um, getting the word out, and we're available to help. We do have a phone unit as well as an email response team that will help businesses get to the assistance that they need. I guess I'm asking about criteria specifically. Oh, right. So we're working on the criteria right now. I mean, when we, we actually propose one set of criteria, and things have changed so abruptly um, from the legislative version. They are uh, requiring 75% uh, loss in revenue from one year to the next. Um, so that will leave out quite a, a lot of people. Um, we were hoping to not have that criteria in there, but we are working on other eligibility criteria. It's not ready for prime time just yet. All righty, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, th I think it is a good point though. Uh, it depends on what the legislature does. And it would impact, uh, you know, we were asking for more flexibility uh, because we don't want to penalize those businesses who are struggling along during this pandemic, being creative, doing all they could just to keep the doors open. And we're going to penalize them now. Uh, and for those who, who didn't take the initiative, uh, they would be rewarded. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we give as much money out as possible. And again, you know, the limited amount of money uh, that they're talking about now would limit the program as well. Right, got it. Thank you. All right, just a time check for everybody. It is 1235, and we're only up halfway through our queue. Next up is Steve from NEKTV. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Governor. Um, a couple for Dr. Levine, if I could. Um, Dr. Levine, you just mentioned uh, the rise in cases in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, could that be, uh, could those be attributed to, uh, um, to the comorbidities like uh, obesity and diabetes, the increase in testing, uh, the higher incidence amongst Native Americans and things like that? So it was actually Arizona and Florida, but I'm, oh, not, sure, I'm not sure about the status of New Mexico, but thanks for allowing me to talk about this for a second because um, I don't know the specifics yet because this word just came out um, about their increase in cases. And in Arizona specifically, they're very concerned about their increase in utilization of the healthcare system. Um, but you are absolutely correct, and this, you know, this press conference began with the governor's discussion about racial equity. And um, if it hasn't been clear to everyone in the country, the the population in the United States that has been most severely affected by the uh, pandemic is the Navajo Nation. Uh, and we need to recognize that uh, because all of the factors that feed into why that's true uh, feed into um, understanding problems in racial uh, equity in the country. Some of it may have to do with higher rates of some of their underlying conditions that put them at higher risk. Um, but again, that's not necessarily because genetically they're problematic. It may be because how their particular genetics interfaces with the environment that they've been raised in and are living in uh, may dictate why there are higher rates of obesity, why there may be higher rates of substance use, things that are not correlated with uh, being free of COVID, unfortunately. And then to start thinking about the fact that uh, one of the new revelations that come out is a high percentage of those living on the reservation are actually far in distance from actual um, potable water and uh, don't even have that in the uh, site that they're living in. 
Uh, so you can imagine with a strike like that against you, there are many, many strikes against them from the start that have to do with the circumstances they find themselves in, what we kind of term in public health the social determinants of health, whether it relates to poverty, whether it relates to uh, transportation, basic needs like food and water, et cetera. So um, without knowing the specifics of what's happened in Arizona to explain this most recent ups upsurge in cases, there's certainly a lot to explain uh, why the Navajos have had a tougher time. Okay, and, and regarding the, the numbers out of Massachusetts, um, they've lost roughly 7,000 people, uh, fatalities in a state of about 7 million people, um, and most of them being 70 plus. Uh, do, do we know what the, uh, you know, the average fatality rate uh, without COVID would be for that segment of the population in say four months? I mean, how many people over 70 would die, you know, of natural causes and over a four month period. I bet you that information is available somewhere, uh, but I, I don't have it on the top of my head. Um, we'd we'd sure, have to go you. look, we'd have to look for that. But, but you're, making, you're making a very valid point, obviously. Um, and, 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 and there are people that are talking about, you know, losing a generation of people, so to speak, uh, in places in the world that have a very, very high rate uh, in their vulnerable populations uh, where people are dying. Um, I'm not sure what to say about it in the United States right now. Okay, and a quick one for the governor, if I may. Um, governor, uh, you, you talked about racial justice. And in the interest of racial justice right here in Vermont, um, would you be considering uh, uh, pardoning or commuting the sentences for uh, nonviolent drug offenders, uh, which have entrapped so many people of color in our prison system? Um, we are working with the legislature as we speak on a, a justice reinvestment uh, program, so uh, we'll, we'll be considering all aspects of that, but that's, uh, that's moving through as we speak. We've been working on that for the last year or two. Great. Uh, thank, thank you all very much. Okay. Brittany, Local 22. Hello. Um, my question is for the governor. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you feel it's important to support the city's uh, move to paint Black Lives Matter message on State Street. Yeah, I just think, uh, you know, we've, we're seeing um, the frustration throughout the country, and it appears that enough is enough. Uh, there are many, as I mentioned before, uh, even NASCAR weighing in, many uh, sports entities weighing in, individuals uh, all coming together uh, for the common cause. I don't want this to be uh, just a moment in time. Um, I want this uh, to be a time when there's transition to real action. And we have to be reminded of that. And I think this is an expression um, of, uh, of sentiment. And I, I believe that this is a uh, uh, something that the city uh, has asked to do. Uh, they actually take care of the streets. Uh, the State Street is part of what they do. Uh, and to put it in front of uh, the State House, uh, that is, a, again, a symbol of the People's House, uh, we, um, I think, are making a powerful statement ourselves. So I'm just supportive of, of taking that stance uh, to highlight this uh, and to say that we're in this for the long run. We're, gonna, we're going to change things. Thank you so much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Rebecca, if there's time at the end, I have a question for Michael Harrington. But for the governor, um, it, it sounds like um, the disappointment that you and Joan Goldstein and Lindsay Curley have with the, the legislative package, uh, I just want to be clear, it does, it does not sound like you're considering a veto of what they send you at this point. Yeah, no, I mean, that would be, uh, be counterintuitive in some respects. Um, if they're going to give us a, a third of the money, let's say, uh, we need to get the, that in the hands of Vermonters who are in desperate need, uh, as you know, Tim. So uh, we'll take uh, a third of a loaf at this point, uh, but in hopes uh, that they will go back to work and take care of uh, the other two thirds, plus the other uh, phase of this package, uh, so that we're 
you know, providing relief and recovery uh, for individuals, for those who are out of a job. Uh, they, need, they need a place of employment, and we need to provide that for them, and we have the means to do so. In other uh, legislation, the, the mayor's um, coalition has, has put forth a couple of uh, issues, and one of them is extending the uh, TIF deadline, so that because they've kind of lost a year here, and, and another one, which would be more problematic, is uh, changing Act 250 rules for them because they have permitting. Have, have you uh, reflected on uh, either of those issues at all? Yeah, I mean, we would be look favorably on either one of those proposals, uh, where, in fact, in some of the packages uh, that you'll see, uh, we are contemplating how can we put projects uh, uh, fast forward some projects with everyone on board uh, so that we don't prolong the permit process. So that's in line with what we've been thinking in, in terms of the TIF districts. Uh, I'm sure we would look uh, favorably knowing what we know now about this, uh, the crisis that we face and the effect on our economy. Okay, great, thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you, um, this is for the governor. Um, we've asked uh, several times about the travel from out of state, and a representative of your office emailed us to say that just because the number of out of state cars coming into Vermont on Fridays roughly matches the number leaving on Sundays, you can't conclude that people are coming in just for the weekend and not quarantining. Now, since the beginning of the state of emergency, the administration has been characterizing its decisions as being science based and data driven. But shouldn't the data showing similar numbers arriving and leaving over a weekend drive the collection of more detailed information on these visits and quarantining? Well, otherwise, what? Yeah. What, what would be your? What would be the end result? What would you? What would you ask us to do? Let's I, just. I, I'm. I'm just wondering if, if if you're making these decisions on travel with with data that um, that is 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 showing you what's going on, what's actually happening on the ground. Well, and not all our decisions are based on the data, on traffic data. I, 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 could I also ask, are any of the people who are involved in the Winooski outbreak traveling in from out of state? Not that I'm aware of, no. Dr. Levine? Uh, Dr. Levine says not that he's aware of either. Okay, thank you. John Dillon, the uh, VPR. Thank you. Uh, Governor, in, in a normal year, the legislature would be gone by mid-May, and, and now it's mid-June. Those, those were the days, at, John. Those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> I remember normal. Uh, they're, they're now talking about it wrapping up um, the week of the 26th, uh, Friday the 26th, and then maybe staying for a few more days to handle uh, lingering CARES funds issues. So that's, that's three, well, it's five weeks since you have asked them to do it in a week. Um, is your message now just get it done, get it done fast and go home because of the urgent need out there? Is, is that what you're telling us? No, I, I just, want to get this money out the door. I think there's a sense of urgency on the part of uh, business owners and, and those who are unemployed right now. You know, when you look at the numbers, uh, we were at a height of, uh, of 90,000 at one point. Uh, we're down now to maybe 60,000 or something like that, 50 or 60,000. That's 50 or 60,000 people unemployed right now because many of them, because the businesses aren't open or are not open to the full capacity. Uh, so we need to provide relief uh, for that. We need to make sure that we uh, preserve that because if, if we don't, uh, if those businesses fail, uh, we're going to have, you know, possibly thousands and thousands of people unemployed over the long term. So I'm saying uh, we have the money, uh, we have the CARES uh, money that was forwarded to us by Congress for just this purpose, and I'm just asking us to act. Uh, you know, let's move forward. Uh, let's uh, let's shore up this uh, the the crumbling foundation that we're seeing in our economy. So, it's just a not a frustration. Well, maybe it is a frustration. We we just need to act. Uh, we have the money to do so. We need to take that step. And and their philosophy is hanging on to some, well, two thirds or at least half until the fall. Um, 
in hopes of flexibility. Do you just does that make sense to you at all? Well, I, I understand the temptation. I really do. I mean, it's not going to be easy uh, to deal with a three or four hundred million dollar uh, budget deficit, but. Uh, it's not easy for those businesses right now who are struggling to figure out how are they going to survive through no fault of their own. So we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll take those steps. But if we don't have the income, the revenue uh, from these businesses, because they, they're not, they don't exist anymore, and we're continuing to pay out in terms of unemployment because people aren't employed anymore, uh, then, you know, what are we doing? And I, and I think you know, we need to take action today. We have the means to do so, and we just need to move forward. Thank you. A3, WCAX. My question is for Secretary French. So we're just wondering if the Agency of Education has a plan yet for when high school uh, driver's ed and behind the wheel instructors can get back in a car with students to complete driving hours. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are working with the State Board of Education. I'll be part of it. Um, the State Board uh, received a waiver request from me a couple months ago, and they're going to uh, take that up at their meeting this coming week. Uh, but we are also working with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Department of Motor Vehicles to, you know, continue to reopen things and try to get these programs up and running this summer. And a quick follow-up: Are you all leaning toward waiving the six-hour observation requirement? like the DMV has and kind of pivoting that responsibility to the parent? Uh, that was my uh, disposition a couple months ago when I presented the waiver to the state board. Uh, I'm not convinced uh, that waiver is now needed considering we're opening the programs back up. Uh, but that'll be, I think, the issue before the state board next week. Okay, thank you. Maria, Washington Post. Um, so, uh, I want to ask about, about the, the 14 people under investigation in the hospital for COVID. Um, do test results are coming back so quickly? That's been a pretty consistent number week to week, unless I'm mistaken. So, what, what is the situation with them? Um, you know, are, are, are there more people who have been hospitalized who have ultimately test positive, but have they been discharged before, you know, um, we get that test back? Or what, what is happening with that? Maybe you could repeat the question. Did you say we don't have, maybe I misunderstood, we don't have 14 people hospitalized? Well, oh, under investigation? Yeah, under investigation, right. It's been a, kind of a consistent figure, and I'm curious about it, um, especially since test results are coming back more quickly nowadays. Yeah, I'm not sure that I understand the question. What does that mean? Is it actually okay. that, there, that there are more people in the hospital with COVID, and are they just before we realize that they were hospitalized? Or? You know, you do make a good point, but not every hospital has the turnaround capability on the test to uh, get it back as quickly as they'd like, but certainly within a day, I would think. But the, I, the category of under investigation just means they're fitting what the admitting physician views as a person who should be under investigation. Doesn't mean that the reason they felt weak and passed out was COVID, but COVID could be the reason, but they might have just been dehydrated or had an infection of another sort. So when those do not convert into hospitalizations, um, if they were COVID, they would be then put in the category of recovering from COVID because they were in the hospital such a short time and got out. So I suspect that they're just more people with a greater suspicion for the diagnosis that doesn't actually turn into uh, COVID. And so that's just a high rate of um, clinical judgment being exercised that says we ought to consider COVID for the reasons this person's here. It's the best okay. I can do. That's thank the best you. I that's can do for you. Um, no, that's, thanks for that. Um, just a couple of quick follow-ups. Um, Governor, earlier on um, this test conversation, you mentioned um, Frank, you know, that there have been some mistakes in the past. Um, you know, the state does look better than other states, but what, what is your assessment of that? What, what mistakes do you think were made in the past? Um, is, is the new one of them? Did something yeah, uh, um, yeah. transmitted there? M mistakes was probably a strong word on my part. Um, I, I just think that we all evolve through any crisis, any experience that we might have. 
on uh, and then reflect on how we can do things better. Um, certainly, if we, in the beginning, uh, if we'd had better uh, testing and tracing, we might not have even had the number of cases we have today. Um, but uh, but that wasn't the the case. We didn't have that capability, and we've we've increased that since. So. Um, I don't know if it's a mistake or had we had the, the, the foresight before all this happened uh, to put in place a better uh, testing and tracing program, um, we would have been better off, but we didn't have that ability, uh, nor was the science uh, keeping up with it. So we've evolved uh, very well uh, and taken advantage of, of that and increased that, and, and our numbers uh, prove that out. So I'm, I'm very pleased with where we are. Uh, but obviously, uh, if we could have uh, had better, uh, again, better testing in the beginning uh, to the capacity we have today, uh, we would have undoubtedly been better off. But that's that's reflecting on, you know, what was what was going on a month or two ago. And just pardon me, the, the other part of that question about Winooski, um, what happened there? We've been asking for some time, I think, since the case is numbered around 30. Now they're, I think, past 80. So what actually happened? What, you know, did, did, was there a barbecue, a soccer game, like something vague that wouldn't violate anyone's privacy, but we still don't know what happened. Yeah, I just believe that they were all socially uh, connected uh, throughout that community. It's a, a small, dense uh, population uh, in Winooski, a very small uh, city, and, um, and it's just very socially connected and, and, and had some social events together. Um, I think, you know, like Dr. Levine was saying earlier, it's helpful when the media covers these things in some detail so that people understand as you lose the restrictions how this can spread. Um, any details whatsoever? I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer. So, so, no, I'm not aware of a, a, a core event that would have brought a lot of people together. So one thing you need to know about the, the growth and the numbers, uh, which we predicted for you, if you will, is that with the large percent of asymptomatic uh, conditions in those who are test positive, um, it indicates that the rate of spread, usually within small communities and within households, um, was relatively easy for that to occur. So just like the governor said, a densely populated city, um, often there's densely populated homes. Um, and easy to transmit within a very small um, household or within, um, as he termed it, their, their community. So um, I, I can't really give you like uh, everybody attended some specific event and came down with something uh, because that's not the way that this plays out. All right, thank you all very much. Guy Page. Hello, Governor. Can you can you assure Vermonters that the protesters try to establish a police-free autonomous zone in Vermont, like Capitol Hill in Seattle, that you will stop it promptly and decisively, and if so, how? Uh, I'm not familiar uh, with what you're using for an example, Guy. I'm sorry. Um, maybe. Commissioner Sherling may be able to weigh in. Are you aware of that situation? I'm listening, Governor, but I am un unfamiliar with that. Wait a minute. The, the uh, protesters that have taken over six square blocks in Seattle, the lead of every news story, uh, de declared it a police-free zone. Uh, neither of you are aware of it. I, I read a variety of national news this morning that uh, did not come up, and we are focused on uh, both the COVID response and Vermont law enforcement and policing reform. Yeah, I, admittedly, I, I must not be that worldly uh, guy because I have not, I've never read the article either. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Aaron, BT Digger. Aaron, BT Digger. All right, we'll go to Colin 
months, seven days. Uh, no question at this time. It was answered. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Colin. Colin. And Tim, we'll go back to you, Tim, Vermont Business Magazine, and you had a follow-up question on labor. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. All right, I think we're good. Um, oh, go ahead, Tim. Um, the the uh, number of uh, new unemployment claims went up uh, this week for the first time in about two months, and I was wondering if there was an explanation for that. And it was it was kind of noticeable. It was like 185 claims or so. Are you um, uh, not that I'm aware of? Are you speaking specifically for the Vermont claims or the national claims? For the Vermont claims, yeah. Yeah, they've been going down, as, as of course you know, for the last couple of months, yep. sort of slow and steady, and there was a, a little bit of an uptick, and I was wondering if there's some, you know, spot reason for that. Or uh, not that I'm just, aware. More people are looking for work, you know. But that's sort of... um, so let me just back up. So it, in terms of the claims going up, I think you're talking about a few hundred, right? Yeah, a couple hundred, yeah. 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 Um, no, I think what we are seeing is, you know, there is a lot of uh, flexibility in uh, the um, in the workforce right now. So we're just seeing a lot of movement up and down with people um, that may have gone back to work uh, part time and then come back off of work and file again. Um, we do continue to receive and see initial claims uh, in the amount of about anywhere from 250 to 300 initial claims per day, about 1,500 a week. Um, and so again, it's, it's just very fluid at the moment. So in terms of seeing a few hundred, I, I'm not sure I could tie that back to any specific reason. Um, but uh, I will also, I'm happy to follow up with our labor market information division to see whether or not they saw an increase in any, uh, in any one sector. Okay, great, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we'll see you all on Monday. Thank you very much for tuning in.